Self evokes emotion, uh, it creates excitement, it creates you know, something that evokes feelings in the listener. We, we, we actually, as, as a cappella singers, as barbershoppers, as singers that sing music that is really some of the, the greatest music written over the last 120 years or so, you know, we, we have an opportunity. We're singing songs that are relatable, we're singing songs that evoke emotions. And, when a, uh, an artist locks into the meaning that the composer and the arranger had, and they bring life to that, and they, they understand it, and they're able to, to convey that with genuine emotion, it actually creates a bond between the performer and the listener. It actually gives you access to emotions in the audience. You'll notice in the best performances that by halfway through the performance, the entire audience is breathing with the performer. How amazing is it to think that you could be involved in synchronizing the breath of 2,000 people? Right? I mean, that's the power that our music has. And, and we allow people to unlock emotions that they have and feel things that we tend to lock away. How many of you have heard a great performance and you start feeling emotions that you're just overcome with? Right? And, and, and when that happens, boy, there's nothing more powerful because that's what changes people's lives. That's what changes your life as a performer. That's what changes their life as a listener. And it's really important to understand as a song progresses, as music progresses, how do, how do things change? If you start doing things that are, that are incompatible with what the composer intended or the arranger intended or the lyricist intended, it's like you sever that bond and you leave people to deal with the emotions themselves. Right. And they'll typically let you in. You know, they'll give you they'll give you one opportunity. If you sever it again, then they won't trust you. And they start to shut down, and then they start to be aware of the technique, right? Rather than the journey that you took them on. So this is a it's a really powerful thing. It's a powerful opportunity we have. Let's listen listen to this again. Listen to Heart of My Heart again. Follow along. I'll scroll through the music here. And see if you can, if you hear something perhaps in this song that you've never been aware of before, or you notice something in the music. Heart of my heart, I love you. Life would be no. Oh 
not I love you, like in the rest of the song, but I love you. We stretch it out to double the amount of time, and we have all that bass embellishment there. What do you suppose if we're singing I love you, and we have all that embellishment going on, what do you suppose that represents? Emotion. Emotion. Uncertainty. Butterflies. I've just said, say you'll be mine forever. And now I'm waiting for your answer. I love you. That's what those embellishments say. Shape the line. That's right. It is safe. It is rise and fall, rise of emotion, and then a little more rise, and then it settles back down. I'm fairly certain that's what my son-in-law-to-be was probably feeling on a stage tonight as he proposed to my daughter. So, what else? What else did you notice? Um, the bouncing is on the center center a lot of the time. Yep. When it comes off, it's, it's doing the semi-taking thing. Yeah, we have, that's, that's really great, great observation. Baritones have a lot of semitone kind of movement here. So the baritones are actually, in this song, responsible for tonal center lock. The semitone movement, and in fact, you'll notice that if you look at the melody line, right, semitones often will indicate some sort of an accidental in the music. Right, so look at the melody line, and other than the fast moving ones, like on Light of My Life, where does the first accidental occur? Right here. The first semitone occurs right there. Say you'll be mine forever. Right at the climax of the song. Everything about this points to this being the climax, right? Melody line, the highest melody note in the whole song. Right here, this D flat. Before that, what we have is Building anticipation for what's coming next. Ta da! Say you'll be mine forever. I'm not quite sure. Right? So we have this say you'll be mine forever. But then what happens? So lead leaves this major triad, moves down a half step to create a major seventh chord, a dissonant chord, and then goes to a, a, a non-chord note, a note that's outside of the major key. So what this is saying is this is a singer, this is a person delivering this message who isn't sure what the answer is going to be. Because if they were confident there wouldn't be a major seventh in the melody. There wouldn't be an accidental in the melody. Right, so, so this, this song, there's a lot of different subtexts for this song. Do we have time to do this? So um, do we have four parts so we can sing this? Let's just sing the first line. Mm -hmm. Who, who's got a lead? Who's singing lead? Great, uh, bass, okay. awesome. Uh, baritone, tenors. Awesome, great. So we have we have four parts. Uh, let's just sing the first line. Hard, give us eight five. Hard to find hard. We're just gonna sing the first line. Here we go. Hard She feels comfortable enough 
that she's fallen asleep in your arms and you realize that she is so comfortable and she loves you so completely that she is entrusting her life in your hands. Her safety is dependent upon you. And you see her laying there asleep and you realize she is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. She is what love truly looks like. Sing this to her. Absolutely. 
is it important to understand the why? Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, because if different people are at different stages in their life, and one singing to their baby, and one singing to their 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 new love, they're about to embark on a new life, and one singing, you know, to the person they've spent their life with, and they want them to know this. You know, it, it's it. It, it's going to be different. It's going to be different if someone is going through a divorce. Uh, very, you know, so it's important to know the why as we sing a song like this. So I would contend, and there's a lot of different approaches we could take with this song, but I would contend let's take the subtext approach of this is a proposal. Right? Because the, 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 if you listen, to, if you read the words and listen to the words, uh, say you'll be mine forever seems to be the climactic part of the song. There's a lot of things in point that. So let's let's treat this as a proposal. This is this is by the way is just the polecat version of the song. The polecat version is just the chorus. The title of the song is actually the story of the rose, but there's no mention of a rose anywhere in the song. At least in the chorus. The rose is mentioned in the verse, which I'll play you in a little while. And if we sang the verse then the subtext meaning is pretty clear. There aren't as many opportunities for, for interpretation. That's one of the things that made just this polecat version so much, so flexible, right? But about the song, it was actually written in 1899 by Andrew Mack, uh, wrote the, the music, who is an Irish actor and singer and comedian. Apparently he's the first one to perform this at, at the Academy of Music in New York. The lyrics were written by Alice, and I have no idea who Alice is. And I haven't found anybody who knows who Alice was. There's a couple of schools of thought. The first school of thought is that back in that day, you got paid for writing music and having it published. And the composer got paid one, one amount, and the lyricist got paid an equal amount. And the school of thought is perhaps that Alice is actually Andrew Mack because he wanted to get paid twice. <laughs> that's why it's just Alice. The other school of thought is that Alice is someone who was very special to Andrew Mack, but for whatever reasons could not be with him. And this is actually Alice's love letter to Andrew Mack. The form of the song, which is important to kind of note in the diagram, this is an A B A C form. Do 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 A. forever really begins. 
say you'll be mine until the end of time. I love you. That's what these lyrics say. These are, these are great, great evocative lyrics. Now and, I want to see you again. What's that? Now I want to see you again. You're right. <laughs> Let's, let's, let's sing the first line again. Say you'll be mine forever. That's the most important lyric in the whole song. Melody, we talked about that ascending sequential melody it leads to something important. And what it leads us to, and it pauses for importance at the my darling, I love you. And in fact, you'll notice that it goes, I love you, I love you. And it leads us here. That's the leading tone. I love you. And that tone wants to go to here. And say, I'm almost back home. And then we reload. And it starts again. The pattern we've come to know that builds excitement, that extends something unyielding. And then it gets to the highest point in the song at forever. And then it takes a long time to come back home because it's waiting for the answer. Right? Music really is we start at home and then we travel away and then the journey leads us back home eventually. Right? And in this case, it takes forever to get from me to Ray to Doe. Back home. And harmonically, it takes forever as well. The rhythm. How many of you think of this as a rhythm song? It's really not, the rhythmic theme is not strong, but the rhythm is important. Because if you actually notice the pattern of this, what we have is ta 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 the rhythm repeats as well. It just points to those lyrics saying, right here, my darling, I love you, right? And then it repeats again until we get to a one-time occurrence in the song. We actually have four quarter notes in a, in, in a row. Say you'll be mine, five, four. Say you'll be mine, four, F. That's just like saying, here it is. This is the climax of the song. So as you're looking at a, even a ballad, take a look at the rhythm. Take a look at, the, at how the rhythms are written to see if they point to anything. Where the pattern breaks is typically going to be important. Right? That leads us to the real point of the song. The harmony is interesting in this song because there's a sense of, again, starting at home, and then the first time we move away from home is on the word love. Let's just sing, heart of my heart, I love, so that we go. Heart of my heart, I love. That chord right there, that love chord, is the two seven. It's, it's, it is the barbershop seven chord. It's the chord that must exist in every arrangement for it to be considered barbershop be a barbershop chart, that chord has to be there. 
And, and the, the, the tenor note here is actually what gives it its happiness, right? You notice there's an accidental there. In the key signature, the tenor note would be minor. Just the natural occurring two seven is a minor seven. We, we lift that tenor note there. We lift that so that we have that feeling of, of joy. Let's sing one more time. Ah, here we go. Ah. joy and the harmony that's the first time we move away on love and then the song actually sits at five seven this five seven is the dominant seven and it the function of five seven is to create pull through the music back to the top that's the function is to create harmonic tension that pulls the music back to one it wants to res resolve back to one that is in all music I mean, 5-7, dominant 7 is in Beethoven, it's in Bach, right? It's, it's in Beatles, it's in everything in between, right? It's in, it's in all music, through the history of music, and it's there as a central propulsive force. So we actually get to that on you, and then that wants to resolve back to home base, and it actually takes four measures to get there. So there's tension building in the harmony. We said, part of my heart, I love you, and then tension, life would be not without you. That almost leads to the sense of a little bit of, of uncertainty and a little hint of desperation. The harmony says, I'm tense about what I'm about to tell you. I'm nervous. My life would be nothing without you. I hope you feel the same way. And you also notice that there are some chords in here. Darling, love, and love where we have some uh, diminished, has some half diminished chords. There are some chords that in and of themselves add tension. Those chords just feel a tug. Let's sing, the light of my life, light, 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 light. Let's sing that, here we go. The light of my life, my So in order to make those chords tug, we'd have to reinforce those notes. We need more presence from our tenors than normally, and we need, and we need to have tug on that love chord from a, just a, a probably a duration and a crescendo. Does that make sense? Now, the song itself, the interesting thing is that for most of the song, the harmonic rhythm, the amount of time that the chords change is very slow until we actually get to the point of the song. Say you'll be mine forever. The chords change on almost every note. So as you just listen to it, let's just sing, say you'll be mine. Say, 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 say. Here we go. Say you'll be mine forever. So right in there, changing so rapidly right at the climax of the song right when we're saying I'm not sure how this person's going to react so that just again leads to this sense of uncertainty and vulnerability in the performer and then we also talked about the embellishment at the end so allow us to listen to another version of the song and this version has the verse
Which, which is really a different way of 